Toshiba Device and Storage Corporation CMOS Logic ICs E-Learning Usage Considerations Handling of Unused Input Pins Generally, all unused inputs should be tied to either VCC or ground. However, any pins of bidirectional bus buffers, e.g., function 245, that can be configured as an output, e.g., bus pins, should be tied to VCC via a pull-up resistor or to ground via a pull-down resistor. It is recommended that both ends of the buffer be pulled up or down to the same potential to avoid unnecessary current flow. However, leave the input pins with bus hold, such as those of the ICs of the TC74 VCXH series, open. Large inrush current due to parasitic capacitance, in the order of a few milliamperes, can be a problem even with typical CMOS logic ICs when their power supply is on. In order to improve system reliability against device destruction and other failures, their inputs can be tied to VCC via a pull-up resistor or to ground via a pull-down resistor. Because CMOS logic has a very high input impedance, any open input might result in a false output value due to the influence of a surrounding electric field. In addition, shoot-through current might flow at the midpoint of VCC and ground, causing an increase in supply current and leading to device destruction in the worst-case scenario. Be sure to apply these considerations to all inputs without a bus hold capability unless otherwise instructed in the datasheet. Input Rise and Fall Time Specifications in the datasheet, the rise and fall times of general-purpose CMOS logic ICs are specified in the operating ranges in which their functional operation is guaranteed. Use CMOS logic ICs within the operating ranges to prevent a malfunction due to output oscillation etc. If a slowly rising or falling signal, a low slew rate signal, is applied to an input, a current spike occurs during switching, causing VCC and ground bounce, which might result in output oscillation or a malfunction. Use ICs with a Schmidt trigger input for slowly changing inputs. However, in the case of excessively slowly changing inputs, even ICs with a Schmidt trigger input might not be able to suppress noise on power supply or signal lines, resulting in output oscillation or instability. The following table shows the rise and fall times of a typical IC in each series. Input rise and fall time specifications. Multiple outputs from a general-purpose CMOS logic IC come into conflict. Short circuiting. Unlike diodes, the outputs of typical CMOS logic ICs cannot be wired or together, except those with three state outputs. Even in the case of CMOS logic ICs with three state outputs, unintended current might flow, causing IC degradation if they are enabled simultaneously. When creating a circuit design, ensure that multiple outputs will not be enabled at any given time. Also, the outputs of CMOS logic ICs without bus hold become unstable if all of them are disabled, i.e., assume the high Z state, without being pulled up to VCC or down to ground. For a description of logic transitions of three state bus buffers, see the FAQ entry Do bidirectional bus buffers have any constraints on the timing of the direction, DIR, and other input signals? For a description of bus hold, see the FAQ entry What is bus hold? Only the gates in the same package may be wired and to increase the drive capability, i.e., output current. However, it is recommended to use high drive ICs, with an I.O. of plus minus 24 milliampere, instead. For a description of high drive CMOS logic ICs, see the DC characteristics table shown in the FAQ entry how many amperes of current can an output pin drive. Connecting a load capacitance to a CMOS output pin. When an output pin of a CMOS IC is connected directly to a large load capacitance, its propagation delay increases. In addition, the increased charge-discharge current into or out of the capacitor might cause noise or a bonding wire burnout. Since current flows to the output parasitic diode at power down, a CMOS IC should not be connected directly to a large load capacitance. If it is necessary to connect a capacitor directly to the output of a CMOS IC in order to increase its delay time or filter out noise, its capacitance should be 500 picofarad or less. When a larger capacitor is required, a current limiting resistor R, should be connected between the IC output and a capacitor as shown below. CMOS ICs with an output tolerant function do not need a current limiting resistor R, for power down. However, a current limiting resistor R, might be necessary to limit the charge current into the capacitor. When a capacitor is discharged as a result of power down, current flows to an internal protection diode returned to VCC via the input pin. 
In the case of an input pin, current flows to an internal protection diode returned to VCC when a capacitor is discharged as a result of power down. Therefore, a large load capacitance should not also be connected directly to an input pin. A capacitor of up to 500 picofarad may be connected directly to the input of a CMOS IC, but when a larger capacitor is required, a current limiting resistor RS, should be connected between the IC input and a capacitor as shown below. Calculating the operating supply current and power dissipation. Power dissipation should be calculated from both of the following. Static supply current. Dynamic supply current. Power can be obtained by multiplying current by the voltage applied to an IC. Static power dissipation, PS. While CMOS logic is in a static state, little current flows in it except tiny leakage current that flows across the internal reverse biased PAN junction, known as static supply current, ICC. Static power dissipation is ICC multiplied by the supply voltage. PS equals VCC times ICC. VCC, voltage applied to a logic IC. ICC, static supply current shown in the datasheet. Dynamic power dissipation, PL plus PPD. Dynamic supply current is the current that flows in CMOS logic ICs while its input transitions between high and low. This current flows during the charging and discharging of capacitance. It is necessary to consider both parasitic capacitance, internal equivalent capacitance, and load capacitance. Dynamic power dissipation is dynamic supply current multiplied by the voltage applied to the P-channel or N-channel MOSFET. For the sake of simplicity, the following calculation assumes that this voltage is equal to VCC at which dynamic supply current becomes the maximum. Dynamic power dissipation due to load capacitance, CL, PL. PL means power dissipation when an external load is charged and discharged as shown by the right hand figure. The amount of charge, QL, stored on the load capacitance is calculated as follows. Here CL indicates the load capacitance. Let the output signal frequency VF out. Then, the average current, IL, is expressed as follows. Hence, dynamic power dissipation, PL, is as follows. If an IC has multiple outputs, its dynamic power dissipation can be calculated as follows. Dynamic power dissipation due to internal equivalent capacitance, CPD, PPD. CMOS logic ICs have various parasitic capacitances as shown by the right-hand figure. These capacitances are equivalently expressed as CPD. Actually, CPD is calculated from power dissipation at relatively high frequency, 1 MHz, under a zero load condition. PPD is the power dissipated by the equivalent capacitance of an IC and can be considered in the same manner as PL. Note, however, that PPD is calculated at input frequency, Fn. Total power dissipation, PTTL, can be obtained as the sum of static power dissipation, PS, and dynamic power dissipation, PL plus PPD. PTTL PS plus PL plus PPD. Level shifting using an input tolerant function. An input tolerant function can be used for level shifting. When the maximum operating voltage of an IC is higher than the supply voltage, VCC, the input tolerant function allows a voltage of up to the maximum operating voltage to be applied to an input while the power supply is active or at zero volts. The input tolerant function allows level shifting from a higher voltage to a lower voltage. Product selection options. The 74BHC and 74LCAX series can be used for conversion from 5 volts to 3 volts. The 74 VCAX series can be used for conversion from 3 volts to 1.2 volts. The following shows an equivalent circuit for a typical CMOS logic IC. The diodes on the input side are inserted for the purpose of ESD protection. The diode between the input and the power supply might turn on if a voltage higher than VCC is applied or voltage is applied when the IC is off. In this case, the IC might be destroyed by the resulting large current. Device destruction can be prevented by using an IC with an input tolerant function, i.e., an IC without a diode between the input and power supply. Example of application of the power down protection function. Partial power down. Partial power down is possible if an IC with a power down protection function is used. To reduce power consumption, a system with two voltage domains, VCC1 and VCC2, might provide partial power down mode in which the subsystem operating from VCC1 is shut down. Suppose, for example, that the 74VHC series is used in the VCC1 domain. 
the 7.4 VHC series has an unintended parasitic diode between the output and power supply. Therefore, when VCC2 is greater than VCC1, this parasitic diode turns on. In this case, the IC might be destroyed by the resulting large current. Device destruction can be prevented by using an IC with neither an input nor output parasitic diode. E.g., 7.4 VHCT, 7.4 LCX, and 7.4 VCX series. These series provide power down protection. Input tolerant and output power down protection functions available with each series. The following table shows whether each CMOS Logic IC series provides the input tolerant and output power down protection functions. Types of noise to be noted. Care should be exercised as to switching noise when using CMOS Logic ICs. Major types of noise include a. Switching noise, overshoot, undershoot, ground bounces. B. Signal reflection. C. Crosstalk noise. See the figure below. Each type of noise is detailed in the following subsections. These types of noise are caused by the output slew rate, DIDT or DVDT, and the output trace. Care should also be taken as to electromagnetic interference, EMI. Noise generated under multiple combined conditions and electromagnetic susceptibility EMS, noise emitted by nearby electronic devices. Countermeasures 1 for reducing switching noise. The MOSFETs in a CMOS logic IC make switching transitions while charging and discharging internal and external load capacitances. The trace impedance during switching can be regarded as an LCR circuit. Since the switching current I, flows through inductance, L, a spike voltage, equals L, DIDT, appears on the VCC and ground lines of the CMOS logic IC. This noise is called switching noise. Multiple simultaneously switching outputs draw a large charge discharge current and therefore cause a large switching noise, called simultaneous switching noise. The following lists the measures for the reduction of switching noise. Countermeasures to reduce switching noise. 1. Increase the width and reduce the length of VCC and ground lines to reduce their inductance. 2. Place a bypass capacitor between and as close as possible to the VCC and ground pins of the CMOS logic IC, see below figure. Countermeasures to reduce switching noise. 3. Exercise care as to clock and reset signals. Unused inputs of gates such as drivers should be connected to either VCC or ground. Connect a low-pass filter to the output of used gates to remove noise. 4. Select low noise ICs. 5. Add a damping resistor to the output of used gates, see below figure. It is necessary to adjust the value of the damping resistor by checking the output waveform. Countermeasures for signal reflection. In the case of high-speed CMOS logic ICs, reflections cause an increase in the signal delay, ringing, overshoot, and undershoot. Reflections in transmission lines. Typical traces have a characteristic impedance of 50 to 150 ohm. However, the I.O. impedance of high-speed CMOS logic ICs differs from the typical characteristic impedance of traces. This impedance mismatch causes part of the transmitted signal to be reflected to both the transmitting and receiving ends of a transmission line. Signal reflection does not affect a slowly rising output because its rise period overlaps that of the reflected signal. Signal reflection causes a problem when the reflected signal returns to the output after it rises, i.e., when the following equation is true. TR is less than 2T. TR, rise time of the output signal. T, propagation delay time from the transmitting end to the receiving end of a transmission line. Suppose that the output rise time is 3 nanosecond that the propagation delay time along a transmission line is 5 nanoseconds per meter. Then, signal reflection has a significant impact when the transmission line is 60 centimeters or longer. Countermeasures to reduce signal reflection 1. Increase the board assembly density and reduce the length of board traces to reduce their inductance and capacitance. In this case, however, care is required as to crosstalk between adjacent traces. See section 9.3. 2. Do not use ICs with an output current higher than necessary. 3. Provide electrical terminations so that the I.O. impedance of a CMOS logic IC matches the characteristic impedance of the transmission line, see below figure. 4. 
when the output of a CMOS logic IC drives multiple CMOS logic ICs the output trace should be fanned out close to the driven ICs. Right hand side figure. Countermeasures for crosstalk. Crosstalk noise is induced by capacitive or inductive coupling between two adjacent transmission lines that run in parallel, called an aggressor and a victim. Regarding crosstalk, care should be exercised as to rapidly rising or falling signals. When such a signal travels through a transmission line, crosstalk noise is induced in an adjacent line, victim, and propagates in both directions. In the same direction as for the aggressor signal and in the direction opposite to it. Since the speed of crosstalk propagation is equal to that of the aggressor signal, the crosstalk noise that travels in the same direction as the aggressor signal, called far end crosstalk, appears as pulse-like noise. On the other hand, the crosstalk noise that travels in the opposite direction, called near end crosstalk, maintains a constant level while the aggressor signal propagates along the line. Crosstalk noise also propagates along the aggressor line and then returns to the victim line. Generally, you can prevent crosstalk as follows. Measures for crosstalk. Add earth traces between parallel traces. Alternatively, use a multi-layer board in which a low impedance layer, e.g., PCC or ground layer, lies between signal layers. Reduce the length of traces that run in parallel. In the case of a multi-layer board, run traces on alternate layers orthogonally to each other, see the right-hand side figure. Increase the spacing between traces. The below figure shows a typical level of crosstalk noise traveling along 30 cm traces. This example shows near-end crosstalk. When the near end of the victim traces the receiving end, it is susceptible to the effect of crosstalk. Countermeasures for hazards. In the case of multiple input combinational logic consisting of OR, AND, and other gates, a slight difference in the timing of input signal changes causes a brief whisker-like pulse called the hazard. Using the circuit shown in below figure, let's see how a hazard occurs because of a difference in signal delays. Suppose that a rising signal transition occurs simultaneously at A and B. The signal applied to B reaches the AND gate via an inverter. Since the signal that enters the AND gate from B is delayed by an inverter, the AND gate receives input signals A and C at different timings, potentially producing a high pulse at the Y output. Countermeasures for hazards. Combinational logic should not be designed to produce a desired output value from simultaneous changes in its inputs. Using a flip-flop to adjust the output timing also helps eliminate a hazard. In addition to a signal timing difference, a slowly changing input can be a cause of a hazard. Hazards due to a slowly changing input can be prevented by using a logic gate with the Schmidt trigger input. Countermeasures for metastability. The output of a synchronous sequential circuit can potentially persist in an unstable equilibrium called the metastable state, depending on the timing of a data signal to be latched relative to the clock signal. A sequential circuit enters a metastable state when its input setup and hold time, TS and TH, requirements shown in the datasheet are not satisfied. Metastability potentially occurs when an active input, e.g., a clock signal, and a passive input, e.g., a data signal, are asynchronous to each other. To prevent sequential circuits from entering a metastable state, the recommended timing conditions shown in the datasheet must be satisfied. For example, when the CK and D inputs are asynchronous, they can be synchronized as shown below. In this case, however, care should be exercised as to the cycle period and propagation delay of CK. If they are close, the data signal might not propagate to the second flip-flop. The synchronizer shown in figure 5.3 consists of two flip-flops. The first flip-flop prevents an increase in TPD and a hazard from being transferred to the output of the second flip-flop. Even in this case, care is needed when the phase difference between CK1 and CK2 is close to the CK to Q delay TPD, of the first flip-flop. Countermeasures for latch-up A latch-up is a phenomenon specific to CMOS integrated circuits that is caused by SCR, silicon controlled rectifier, generation. Let's consider a CMOS logic IC formed on an N substrate. A CMOS logic IC has various parasitic bipolar transistors, Q1 to Q6, internally forming a triac circuit. A common cause of a latch-up is excessive noise, surge voltage, or surge current on an input or output pin of a CMOS IC. Another cause is a sharp change in the supply voltage. 
In such cases, the internal triac circuit turns on, causing an excessive current to continue flowing between VCC and ground even if the triggering signal is disconnected, and eventually leading to the destruction of the IC. The following briefly describes the process leading to a latch up. The right hand figure shows an equivalent circuit of a CMOS circuit, including its parasitic structure. An NPN transistor, Q2, is formed in the P well on the N channel MOSFET side while a PNP transistor, Q1, is formed in the N substrate on the P channel MOSFET side. Parasitic resistances, RS and RW, also exist between IC pins. Parasitic elements, Q1 and Q2, form a thyristor. For example, if current flows into the N substrate because of an external cause, a voltage drop occurs across resistor RS in the N substrate. As a result, Q1 turns on, causing current to flow from VCC to ground via resistor RW in the P-well. The current flowing through RW produces a voltage difference across RW, which turns on Q2, causing supply current to flow via RS. Since this further increases the voltage difference across RS, Q1 and Q2 remain on. Consequently, the supply current continues increasing. As described above, CMOS ICs suffer from a latch-up problem when voltage differences occur across RW in the P-well and R's in the end substrate. Countermeasures for latch-up Use under the rated conditions But it is recommended to add a protection circuit to the IC interface as shown in below figure. If an excessive surge might be applied to the IC. Countermeasures for ESD protection CMOS logic ICs provide electrostatic discharge ESD, immunity compliant with international standards. Exposure to higher ESD might cause a malfunction or permanent damage to a CMOS logic IC. Because the oxide film at the input gate of a CMOS logic IC is very thin, hundreds to thousands of angstroms, it could be damaged by an ESD of hundreds to thousands of volts. To prevent this, each input pin generally provides ESD protection circuitry. However, there is a limit to this protection. Insert external ESD protection diodes for the inputs that might be exposed to excessive ESD, e.g., inputs connected to a board's external interface. There are various ESD models. The following describes one of the major ESD models. Human Body Model, HBM. This model characterizes the susceptibility of a semiconductor device to damage from ESD that might be generated from a human body. There are numerous discussions on the human body capacitance. For ESD immunity testing, the charged human body is modeled by a 100 picofarad capacitor and a 1500 ohm discharging resistor. During testing, the capacitor is fully charged and then discharged through a resistor. The HBM test circuit is shown below.